We are at the Old Nick Williams Farm and Distillery in Louisville, North Carolina. Family actually started here in 1768, uh, built the first distillery and was passed along generation, father to son, father to son, um, up into the er uh, late 1800s. Uh, Prohibition ultimately killed the business and uh, now we've revived it and built it back on the same site. We were a, 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 a national brand as well as an international brand even pre-Prohibition. Uh, we set up for the U.S. Department of Agriculture at the Paris Expo in uh, Paris, France and uh, we also set up at the Chicago World's Fair and, and you know promoted the product there. Basically North Carolina started really putting the squeeze uh, on distilleries in the early 1900s. Uh, started introducing laws where you had to be an incorporated town uh, to, to operate. Uh, then you had to grow those towns at certain rates um, to ultimately entering into prohibition. A lot of people don't know that North Carolina was actually the first state in the United States to enact prohibition. We were also the last state in the United States to repeal it. So, um, you know, even today we still work under pro prohibitive laws that were on the books then. We just visited the site where the revenuers came in and disposed of the glass bottles uh, that were full of the whiskey at Prohibition. Uh, it's also where they destroyed the barrels. We had over 20, uh, 22,000 gallons of liquor here aging on the farm with an estimated value over a half million dollars uh, pre-Prohibition. You know, Matt and I grew up digging in those glass piles hoping to find those elusive bottles that slid past the revenuers. Um, and, and luckily, uh, one day when we were 10 or 11 years old, we found that whole bottle. Wasn't full, but it was intact, uh, which was uh, a pretty cool feat at 10 years old. You know, we sprinted all the way from the glass pile into the family home and uh, shared shared our find with with everybody here. It was pretty cool. The family has been involved with with battling the state and federal government for hundreds of years. Um, great grandfather actually fought to the U.S. Supreme Court and battled those guys on taxation, um, and and you know ultimately dealt with that throughout the, the his entire tenure of the company. He also dealt with prohibition here in the state, um, local revenuers. Um, there's documentation across the brand where, where it was a consistent problem. You know, guys back then would have an issue with another guy. What's funny is the men that owned the distilleries back then were actually the revenuers in different areas. So if this guy didn't like you as a distillery owner, he might come down and be the revenuer who's now trying to implement taxes on you. So uh, it, was, it was kind of a dirty trade, I guess you would say. Um, it's not cleaned up much, maybe a little. <laughs> My great-grandfather died in 1913. So North Carolina Prohibition was enacted in 1909. Uh, he died in 1913. Federal Prohibition was enact, er, enacted in 1919, implemented into the 20. Okay, so um, there were 11 kids, I think, or 11 or 12 kids, and none of them were old enough to really take the reins of running the distillery. Uh, and with that being said, North Carolina was still under pro prohibition. Uh, it wasn't until after the Great Depression that my grandfather tried to, to form the business again. The problem was North Carolina was still under prohibition law. Uh, so he tried to do that in Roanoke, Virginia, and the bank wanted him to secure those financial notes with the farm. And right after the Depression, he was scared to do that. So the business just died, you know, never was revo uh, revived. and then. Uh, Years ago, you know, I started buying web names, uh, started talking about this venture to friends, and uh, actually the very first night I met my fiance, I told her one day I was gonna own a whiskey business. Had no clue it was gonna be as quick as it was. Um, but it was something that we all knew was gonna happen at some point, and we finally got enough of us together, we were able to raise the capital and, and go ahead and take the step. We have a couple products now. We have our unaged whiskey that hasn't been in barrel, and we have our bourbon. Um, our bourbon is a weeded bourbon. It, uh, we use all North Carolina grain in it, non-GMO corn. So the mash bill is corn, wheat, and malted barley. And uh, make a real good product. We bottle it 92 proof, and we actually just won a double gold medal on it at the San Francisco Spirit Competition. So we're really, really pleased with it. You know, I grew up hearing stories from my great uncle or my grandfather about what we would be similar to. Uh, we're similar to a Michener's, we're similar to a Maker's Mark. Um, you know, those weeded bourbons um, that are real soft and subtle, that's what they're gonna get from our product. Uh, we do have a, a, a unique oakiness to it uh, that I think stands out and kinda touches on the back of your palate 
um, and a lot of people like that oakiness. It's almost like a double oaked product that's not been in a double barrel. When we started the company, we actually drew some old fluid from an old bottle and sent it off to have it analyzed to uh, try to get an idea of what, what exactly was in it. Our brand is modeled to be as close to what my great grandfather would have done 125 years ago. And I think that's very important for our brand and very important for our products moving forward to stay true to what our family did. When they come here to the Old Nick Williams Farm and Distillery, they're stepping back in time. Uh, they have the opportunity to try products very similar to what our ancestors would have made here on the farm a couple hundred years ago um, and truly get that pre-United States feel. And so you ought to give these guys at Rackhouse Whiskey Club a try. Sign up, check out the products, and see what they have to offer.